Today here at Robert's Guitar Dungeon, we're talking about the 10 worst guitar amps ever. Well, 10 that I really, really don't like anyway. You know, I'm an amp guy and I can think of very, very few times in my life when I ran across an amplifier that I really didn't like. That said, there are a few times in my life that I ran across an amplifier that I really, really didn't like, and that's the, this is going to be that list. For the record, we are not talking about cheap, tiny, little 10 and 15 watt practice amps that you start out with when you're a teenager that cost 50 bucks brand new. We all know those suck. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual amplifiers that somebody might spend their hard-earned money on and, well, probably be vastly disappointed after doing so. So let's get to it. Number 10, Bugera 6262. This amp, my understanding, is supposed to be a clone of the famed PV6505. While I am a big fan of the PV6505, the first generation of the of the Bugera 6262, in my opinion, sounded absolutely nothing like it, and found in fact sounded absolutely nothing like anything I would ever want to play through. It was muddy and trill, and ugh, it sounded terrible. The store that I was working at at the time got one in brand new, and. By the time we finally managed to get rid of it, it I don't know how many times we'd had to dust that thing off because it just, nobody wanted it. It sounded terrible. When this line of amps first came out, I, I learned that this is, in fact, Behringer's line of guitar tube amplifiers. I'm a little bit turned off of it just because the beginning of the brand name sounds like booger. I don't want to own a booger amp which is what this thing sounds like. Booger. Booger. Number nine, Ibanez Tone Blaster. Uh, I suppose every major company that caters to the hard rock and metal crowd, they've got to put out a cheap and expensive amp that some you know, metal kit out there can afford. That's, you know, this is Ibanez's. Uh, the TB100H, has absolutely no tonal redeeming qualities whatsoever anywhere. It's a solid state amplifier. The head itself, I think, if memory serves, costs about three or four hundred bucks. I think for three or four hundred bucks, you know, any teenager's money is going to be better spent somewhere else. But hey, you know, at least it says Ibanez on it. And the one co one cool thing about this amp is at least it has a little compartment in the back that you can store the foot switch in. Number eight, Blaney AOR series heads. Blaney AOR series were very popular tube amps back in the 80s, and they came in 1500 watt versions. I really, really didn't want to add this amp to this list because this, the tone of this amp actually does sound really, really good. You know, this is not a bad sounding amp. The problem with this amplifier, the one problem with this amplifier that would ever prevent me from being able to use it in any kind of situation is the bass control. This bass control on this actually has a push-pull function and by pulling the knob out on the amplifier it actually boosts the bass frequencies pretty significantly. Here's the problem. With the, with the boost not engaged the bass turned all the way up is nowhere near enough. With the boost engaged the knob pulled out when you turn the bass all the way down, in that instance, it is way too much. There is a huge, huge gap of really where, in my opinion, where the sweet spot would be for those frequencies that you just can't get to, at least not without any kind of modification. So, you know, it's unfortunate because, in my opinion, I, I actually like the AOR series, but because of that, I just wouldn't, I'd never be able to use it. Number seven. Bogner Alchemist series. This is another example of an amp on this list that is actually a really good sounding amplifier. You know, getting good tones out of this amp is not a problem. The Alchemist series of amplifiers were actually part of a collaboration that Bogner did with Line 6, and they did one for each brand. In the instance of the Line 6, this, the 
Spider Series tube heads are actually designed by Bogner and say so right there on the front of the amp. Uh, in order for Bogner to get something out of this deal, they came out with the Alchemist series, which are, I believe, also Bogner designs, but they are, are built in the Line 6 factory over in China. And that is the problem with this amplifier. While there are lots of good tones to be found out of it, the one problem that everybody seemed to run into is reliability. The store that I was working at at the time began to carry these as soon as they came out. And in doing so, the, we sold them pretty quickly and they all seemed to start getting returned pretty quickly. There was all kinds of reliability issues with these. You know, sounds going, you know, just sound cutting in and out, you know, problems with uh, inputs, uh, effects loops, uh, transformer, you know, wiring issues, all kinds of stuff, you know, and it's, you know, the quality control on these amps, unfortunately, was pretty low, and they sent them out to retail locations to be sold to the public a little bit too soon, in my opinion, uh, which I don't fault Bogner for this. I fault the lines, the folks in Line 6 Factory because Bogner has never put out anything that has ever had these kinds of reliability issues. The store that I was working at, when we when we carried them, we carried them when they first came out, and I can and for several years afterwards. And I cannot recall a time during that period when we didn't have at least two or three open box models out on the floor just from people buying and returning them all the time. Number six, Line 6 Spider 2 Series. The series of amplifiers was actually one of the first of Line 6's solid state modeling amplifiers. And unfortunately, they just sounded terrible. I will give Line 6 credit and say that the modeling in the each subsequent Spider series has improved as each new series has come out, but the Spider 2 series, it makes me wonder how the company managed to stay in business after putting those out because they just sounded absolutely terrible. You know, the clean sounds were okay. You know, even the low gain sounds were okay. The high gain distortion sounds and that the players who they were catering to absolutely sounded terrible. If you were on a budget and you know, all you had to spend was a couple hundred bucks, you know, it might have been worth it, but the tones coming out of that amp, as is the case with a lot of modeling amps from that era, were absolutely, again, unusable. Glenn Fricker of Spectre Sound Studios put a video up on YouTube about a year ago about the Spider 5 series amplifiers. And in his video, he actually showed a demonstration where the Lion 6 Spider 2 series actually sound better than the Spider 5 series. And that video does make it pretty convincing. However, listening to him in person, and while I do respect Glenn's opinion on most things and usually do agree with him, on this particular one, I think the Spider 2 series is definitely the worst sounding amplifier between the two. Number five, Blackstar ID series. Speaking of terrible modeling amplifiers, along came Blackstar. Blackstar launched, I believe, in 2010, and for the most part found themselves competing in the more affordable but good quality tube amplifier market. Blackstar, of course, does have a high-end line of tube amplifiers that sell for thousands of dollars that are regarded as very good amplifiers, but the HT Venue series seem to be their bread and butter. And with that in mind, Again, competing against the same people that might also be buying the Line 6 Sp Spiders and the PV Vipers and the Fender Mustangs. Out comes Blackstar with the ID series. Their own version of solid state amp modeling that, to me, sounded like you may as well have been playing through a transistor radio. The store that I was working at carried them when they first came out, at least the smaller ones, and the Blackstar rep actually came in, and the one that he demoed for us was the smallest amp in the line that had a little bitty six or eight inch speaker in it, and was, you know, the entire amp was about that big, and I was standing there watching him play through it, talking about how awesome it was, trying to figure out how they were planning on staying in business with this guy actually making this amp sound the way that it did. Imagine if you took an amplifier, and you stuck it down in the bottom of an empty galvanized trash can and then cranked it up, that's what this amp sounds like. Number four, PV Wiggy. This is another amp that I debated back and forth about putting on this list because it actually does have a really cool story behind it. The design of this amp started off life as the brainchild of none other than musical legend Frank Zappa. 
he decided to design this amplifier based on the old car that he wrote many of his songs in. Apparently, Frank Zappa wrote uh, a, lot of, a lot of his songs in uh, the old car that he was driving around, and he decided to design an amplifier that was going to mimic the dashboard of that car. Unfortunately, as I understand it, you know, Mr. Zappa passed away before this design became a reality. Several years later, Frank's son, Dweezil Zappa, who was embarking on the Zappa Meets Zappa tour, decided to take this amp out and complete the design and put it to use. So, my understanding is, you know, they fin PV finished the design and Dweezil Zappa took this amp out on tour and, uh, you know, as a tribute to his father, very noble and my understanding is also that is the last time he ever used this amplifier. <laughs> it's a solid state amplifier. It's not that it sounds okay. It's not the worst sounding amp, amp in the world. I will give it that. You know, it's not the worst sounding amp in the world uh, that came, came with an oversized 212 speaker cabinet and uh, had some really oddball controls on it. The thing that with this amp is it, just, it looked like some kind of a toy that I would buy for a three-year-old. I just, I don't see how I could show up, especially as a rock player, how I could show up to an audition or to a gig with a new band with this amp and expect anybody to take me seriously. <laughs> just a little on the weird side for my opinion. I get the inspiration behind it. I get all that stuff. You know, I'm not knocking Frank Zappa or Dweezil Zappa in any way, but th this amp just, this amp is just out there. Number three, Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier. Relax, I'm kidding. You can put the tomatoes away, it was a joke. Number three, Marshall MA100H. I am going to preface this one by saying that I am a Marshall guy. I've got a Marshall t-shirt on. I've got a Marshall JCM 900 on top of a Marshall 1960A cabinet sitting behind me. I'm a Marshall guy. I love just about everything that you guys do. But Marshall, this amp sucks. This was an attempt by Marshall to get into the more affordable import line of tube amplifiers back in the early 2010s and it was just one of the most god-awful amp sounds I've ever heard. Ultra muddy, absolutely, you know, the, it was supposed to have a clean channel on it that had no clean tones whatsoever to speak of. It, you know, the cabinets that came with it were cheap and had cheap crappy speakers in them. They, it just, as much as I love Marshall amplifiers, this was a big, big miss. Another unfortunate side effect about this amp is because, you know, the cabinets anyway, it looks so much, looks so similar to the actual 1960 cabinets. You see these things popping up on the used market for, you know, people trying to get way more than they're worth out of. So for anybody looking to find a used Marshall 412 cabinet, make sure that you know what it is that you're looking for, because these, these can be a little bit tough to spot if you're not familiar with them. Number two, custom tuck and roll amps. These were an amplifier that custom made back in the 60s and 70s, and these things are still all over the place today. They had this real weird, you know, vinyl cushion wrapping thing on the outside of them that did kind of that did give them a unique look. But I believe they had a guitar version, and they had a bass version, and they had a keyboard version, and they had a PA version, and none of those versions did any of those things very well at all and they were great big giant paperweights and they were underpowered and they just sound absolutely terrible. You know, they have no, you know, the clean sucks, the gain on them sucks, the EQ sucks, the everything about them sucks, which is why, you know, a full-size amplifier from the 1960s you can find on the used market, I think I saw one listed for about 250 bucks right before I did this video. So, you can find these things for dirt cheap all over the place, and there is a reason why they are dirt cheap all over the place. The store I worked at, we used to buy these things in from time to time, and we would have to make sure and mark them down very, very low just in order to get rid of them so we weren't sitting on them forever. That's if they worked. There are so many of these things out there that have been abused, and you know some of it is due to abuse, and some of it is just due to not holding up over time. 
these things are notorious to have short circuits either in the potentiometers uh, in the speaker outputs you know the, the speaker inputs in, into the extension cabinets they're just not very well built oh yeah and they sound terrible in case I did mention that part number one Raven amplifiers this is an amplifier brand that was once a proprietary brand which is why they were so cheap but for the money that you were saving on these amplifiers you can make a small a slight sacrifice on wattage and get something that had a lot more you know that had a lot better tone built-in effects and you know something that would actually make this thing pale in comparison to just about any other amplifier out there these are the Raven amplifiers, unfortunately, were some of the most garbage amps I've ever heard. And, you know, personally, I am not opposed to store proprietary brands. I think a lot of them are, you know, a lot of proprietary brands, not just in the musical instrument industry, but all industries. A lot of proprietary brands are good quality products that can help consumers like me and like you save money where appropriate. And this is not one of those instances these are horrible sounding amps that are best used as a landfill today and that's all they're good for don't believe me go find a cheap used one because you'll be able to buy it cheap and try it out that's all for this list i hope you enjoyed it if you haven't already please consider hitting the subscribe button to this channel you will find the little red subscribe button right next to a little black icon little black bell icon right next to it and by selecting both of those both of those buttons you will receive alerts on a pretty regular basis when I upload videos on a pretty regular basis which is typically on Wednesday and Saturday mornings. A description of all of the gear discussed in this video will be down in the description with links and other describable linked up description type things. <clears throat> Last but not least please leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. What's the worst amp that you've ever heard or played through or experienced or any of the above and again we're not talking about cheap $50 10 5 10 15 watt practice amps no I don't I don't want to hear about those 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 suck anyway so thanks so much for watching see you in the next video You know what? There are tons of young people out there that want to get involved in music and do not have the means to do so. If you are watching this video, most likely you're a musician and many experienced musicians have tons of broken and unwanted gear lying around that they're not doing anything with. Please visit my friends at Share the Music on Facebook at the link below and learn how you and your unwanted gear can help change somebody's life.